We, Sonia, and Januni are a couple of pals studying science in undergrad. We are not professionals. Though every episode is meticulously researched, mistakes do happen. If you notice that anything, and we mean anything, we state is inaccurate, please let us know. Your comments, suggestions, and queries are important in furthering our personal and audience's understanding of science. Thanks for being a part of this discussion. We appreciate you. We really do. Bop, bop. Beep, bop, bop. Bada, bop, bop, bop. Let that roll a little bit. What are you doing? Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> 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 the fire on the camera looks so fucking stupid. Um, anyways, I think it's time we start. Oh, <laughs> Is it from the video? Can we restart? No, we'll just keep, we'll roll with it. Good. Um, anyways. Hi, I'm Sonia. I'm Janu. <laughs> That's Januni. And, um, this is Beaker Bros, a video slash podcast. Cast. Yeah. Right? Yeah, about, um, science communication. We're both really interested in research as two undergraduate science students here at McMaster because of the, um, pandemic there hasn't been a lot of opportunity specifically in science communication so we thought hey why not start this channel slash podcast we don't really know how we're going to be posting moving forward but it will definitely be here yeah. on youtube at least i hope so yeah unless something happens to <laughs> YouTube, <laughs> we'll be here every friday, we'll be here every <laughs> friday. <laughs> um but yeah. Yeah, so for today's topic, we want to talk about something that's very important to us and just people in general, because if you don't have it, like, you'll, it's, it's not a good thing. And that is... Men- My depression. <laughs> <laughs> Today, no. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about, like, everyone's depression yeah just like mental health in general just the topic of mental health it's no laughing ma- matter no the way that Janouni brought it up it is very funny the way i cope it is yeah. funny uh-huh it's how yeah uh-huh you're I, sad i, I, joke, you're I make you i like to deal with my sadness by making jokes okay that's yeah. good i'm glad you're coping that's the word <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah especially with the pandemic we think it's a very important topic to explore mm-hmm. and kind of, you know, raise awareness in a sense, too. Yeah, because I don't know about you, but it wasn't necessarily as bad as I know a lot of my peers have endured, mm. but uh, just the effects of isolation. Like, I consider myself a relatively introverted person, but, yeah. like, I still like meeting people. No. I still like talking. I yeah. still like doing all that stuff. No, yeah. I like walking on campus. At first, I took that, like... As, For granted. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I loved walking on campus and just seeing random people. Not mm-hmm. talking to them, not waving at them, just seeing them and just like being like, what, less than two meters. With yeah, distance. that barrier. That, yeah, yeah, like that just feeling like the fact that we have like this invisible murderer floating in the air. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not really, fl- it's suspended in droplets. That's a, like, or aerosols. We're getting scientific here, guys. <laughs> like it's, it's not airborne. If it was, we would be in a lot worse position. But like the fact that there's this thing that's, Posing a barrier between us all, mm-hmm. it inevitably creates a lot of isolation. Yeah. And that's very... That? Yeah. But um, before I, like, um, we dive into... What have you found, Jamie? Well, so, Sonia. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, well, so actually, CAMH, so, like, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, they did, um, like, a survey of, like, what Canadians were reporting about their mental health and, like, even substance abuse during the pandemic. So they did six national surveys, if I'm not mistaken yeah so they did six of them so from like may till like december and the way they did it was pretty cool so there's about like 24 percent reporting that they have anxiety um 23 percent reporting that they felt lonely and 21 percent reporting that they're depressed i know it's like not like a big number like you would assume like 80 percent but still like take into fit like just take into account like how many people there are in canada yeah. right that's like quite a bit and you said that was specifically for which age? Groups? Oh, like, so basically Canadians over the age, like, above 18. Uh-huh. If we're going into more specifics of, like, the age group. So, the age group that was most, like, affected, right, uh, with, like, anxi- anxiety, so, like, moderate to severe anxiety, um, is the age group? I'm blind, sorry. Um, <laughs> 18 to, like, 39-year-olds, right? Yeah. So, the, at a, like, age group is the most affected by it with... 
again blind uh 31.2% and like that was at the beginning of like May and then like in December it was like 33% or so mm-hmm. but yeah and then there's like also they have those who are above the ages of 60 with like around 16% reporting and then those between the ages of 40 to 59 reporting about like 27% yeah so that itself yeah it'd be interesting to see like the effects on like specific minority populations like yeah. the lgbt community or just like uh the, the people of color mm-hmm. or like the black community or anything like that just oh yeah that'd like, be really interesting policy. yeah yeah i think that would be very very cool but this is what they did yeah another thing that's interesting about it so one thing that i found statistic related was um an article that was published by Scientific American. So it looked at uh, young people specifically and uh, like their feelings of loneliness during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And um, it was actually found that, I'm just pulling up my statistics as well. So in a 2020 survey that was conducted during this uh, pandemic um, last year, uh, it found that 71% of millennials and almost 80% of Gen Z, so Generation Z yeah. respondents, so the people who contributed to the survey, yeah. felt feelings of loneliness. And that kind of goes back to two things. One, like I guess that just shows dis- not disparities, but yeah. like discrepancies in um, the population that's collected, like the, the population that they use to collect the data from. Like the sample size? The sample size, yeah. yes. And the population and demographic itself because for you it was saying it was hovering around like 20 to 30 percent for the most part yeah honestly at the same time like it's also how they're taking the surveys too yeah like i don't remember (laughs) answering any survey like over the pandemic yeah so this is probably just like their sample size is probably different from that yeah because this one here oh man you're talking about loneliness right yeah mine is specifically talking about loneliness so So, felt by young people so in the like the CAMH survey, they had people reporting around, like, 28% between the age group of, like, 18 to 39-year-olds reporting loneliness. That's still crazy, though. But it just goes back to the idea of, like, that. And also, um... I just had a brain fart. But it goes back to that idea, like, with young people specifically entering university, like, not having that ability to interact with your peers on, like, a personal, like, face-to-face level. Like, it kind of poses a barrier between uh being able to develop those deep and meaningful relationships mm-hmm. with people but like you know what i mean like no yeah like it makes like you know what we're talking about like welcome week at mac right yeah um so like for me frosh week mm-hmm. that i had like that was where like, i swear that was the only place i made friends like any i didn't really make like friends friends afterwards like yeah i had a few people i met in the courses or whatever mm-hmm. but not I just forgot what I was saying. Um, yeah, yeah. you meet, like, a group of people, like, a couple of people later, but, like, you met that group of people that you, like, hung out. Yeah. Like, you hang out now from, like, the rest, like, of your university career with them, like, during that week, that beginning of the week. So, like, a lot of, like, high school students who were transitioning into university, mm-hmm. but everything being online. Like, you did the online welcome week, right? Uh, yeah, it was a welcome week rep this year, yeah. Yeah, so then, like, with that, like, yeah, there was a whole, like, getting to know but it's virtual like it's not the same yeah like people when you have the option of turning off your camera and muting yourself it's a lot easier to do that online than doing that in person yeah so a lot of people i remember did resort to that it was always a little bit of a push to try to get people Mm. to turn on their cameras but to be fair like to be honest i'd probably do that as well yeah let alone i probably wouldn't even join those events if i was back in first year i'd be like "Eh." you know yeah like yeah whatever but people that did turn out kudos to them if you end up watching this i doubt you will <laughs> two viewers that will end up seeing these videos two viewers at home. <laughs> thanks thanks guys um but no yeah like that makes sense like it i it definitely makes sense for like why people in uni are feeling the isolation and just like you know that whole like being by yourself and mm-hmm. just kind of having to deal and figure things out by yourself because i remember like even like when you're on campus, you turn to the person next to you and be like, yo, what did the prof say? Or like, wait, wait, what? What's <laughs> you're not happening? listening, you can just be like, okay, cool, okay, thanks. Cool. Wait, wait, we have a test? Like, it's a, wait, what? Like, it, you have someone to rely on. What, we've started? No. <laughs> wait, wait, are we two weeks into the course? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so stuff like that. Like, everything's just virtual now. It's not the same. You can't have those personal connections or those personal conversations. Yeah. And it's like, 
there's so much you, it's only so much of a connection you can form yeah virtually or on zoom can i okay i, I want to read this passage that was from the article oh, yeah. that i read because it draws like an interesting analogy from like we say starving as a way to describe um like hunger mm-hmm. and feelings of like sati- satiation mm-hmm. and stuff like that but mm-hmm. i'm gonna like read this so uh one study for example found that when mice, a social creature like us, are forced to live in cages by themselves, it changes their their brain's basic architecture and causes nerve cells to shrink. A more recent study of of what social distancing during the pandemic has been doing to humans identified that the neural underpinnings associated with isolation are similar to those of physical hunger. To say you're starving for contact isn't far from the reality of what's happening in your body in a neurological basis. Oh, wow. Like, that's an interesting parallel, though. Like, you're so, like, heavily deprived of physical, like, human contact. Mm. Like, for people that are fortunate enough to be, like, in relationships or have, like, de- already established uh, deep friendships mm-hmm. and stuff like that, like... To an extent, it's okay. But, yeah. like, I can also, like, look back at the year and just see, like, the friends that I were, like, friends, friends with. I'm no longer, like... Like, still as close, right? It's interesting. Like, that brings up an interesting conversation. Like, the people that... Like, who's been there this yeah. year? Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, my dogs. <laughs> my dogs, my cat, my chalky little boy. Yeah. The puppies that came. And then... Goodbye. Yeah. Beautiful puppies. Yeah. Um, but yeah. There was actually, like, a TikTok trend thing. Where uh-huh. it was, like, to see if, like, you're lacking, like, contact or whatever. It's, like, to, like basically cross your arms and like touch your face and like close your eyes and see how it makes you feel right i mean i'm like, I, you gotta close it and like some people feel like just so like at ease with it and yeah. then you realize wow like i have not had contact with people and like oh i've not like touched a person <laughs> i have not touched a person in a while <laughs> i have not seen a human in four years it's like oh it's been a while but yeah it's it's crazy like just thinking about it can I, t- I want to say another study yeah. that I found really interesting. Sorry to like cut you off there, no, but it's How kinda, rude. I'm, well, get, 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 get up and leave, <laughs> bye. But um, it goes back to that idea of like how, um, what's it called? Like how physical contact makes us feel and how feelings of self-isolation also feel. Like it's drawing, like mm-hmm. it's comparing those. Yeah. So there was a study that was, this one's a little bit old, it was conducted in 1972 by... my dad was born that year. My mother was born that year. Wow. Maybe yeah. they know each other. Anyways, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so 1972, there was this French scientist slash adventurer, Michel, I can't say his name. Cifre? Cifre. 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 Okay. Just because I say it in a French accent doesn't make it any better. <laughs> I mean, I'll take your word for it. But um, he basically, for his study, he trapped himself in this cave in Texas and wanted to study the effects of self-isolation on people. Mm-hmm. Um, he did it to himself, so obviously it's like not representative of everyone's experience when you're undergoing like extended isolation. Yeah. But um, anyways, he trapped himself in, his, in a cave... And during the 205 days that he self-isolated himself in that cave, he took meticulous notes of, um, like, his behavioral changes and how he was feeling. Mm -hmm. And, like, it was crazy some of the stuff that he recorded, like, Mm -hmm. during that time period. There was this one uh, uh, passage that he wrote about, like, trying to befriend a mouse because, like, he was so starved and deprived of, like, any sort of contact. Yeah. It's kind of like, um... Ratatouille. (laughs) <laughs> sorry no <laughs> different dif- no <laughs> it's kind of like um so have you seen the movie cast away with tom hanks no so basically um in that movie he befriends a volleyball named and he names him wilson like the yeah. brand yeah <laughs> yeah and just tries to befriend that volleyball and like what tom hanks did in that movie and, like, everything that he went through while being alone on that island is yeah. not far off what this scientist found just mm-hmm. being self-isolated for 205 days. Wow. Obviously, like, for the most part, people in urban settings are not that deprived of um, contact. Yeah. But it just shows, like, the extent or, like, the extremes of what people endure when they're forced to self-isolate. Yeah. 
without any sort of friendships or anything like that to keep them grounded and sane. No, yeah, that's true. I definitely think, like, the only reason we have not started, you know, befriending, like, inanimate objects is, um, because, like, I mean, social media, right? Yeah. There's, like, things like that. There's still, like, FaceTime, right? It's not the physical contact, but at least it's better than just being in a cave with a rat, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, a mice, sorry. Um, but yeah, like, it's, like, Mm, we are kind of privileged that we're in a time mm-hmm. when technology is kind of that advanced in yes. setting and that like I don't know about you but I downloaded TikTok when pandemic was like it got like when I started feeling really peak. like yeah, yeah. I was like, at the peak and I was like isolated I already pulled, was learning how to play like what grenade by Bruno Mars on my recorder like I already <laughs> did that and I was just like okay like what else do I have right like i I did, like, I painted. I did all this stuff, right? But then I'm like, I am not, like, I want to see people. I want to hang out with people. At first, I enjoyed it because, like, you know what? An introvert kind of like the whole being by myself, doing what I am. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, down with TikTok, I just remember seeing so many faces. And, like, there's kind of, like, aren't there, like, certain kind of uh, neurotransmitters or, like, chemicals that are released when you're on social media? Um... Like dopamine and yeah. like endorphins oh, and yeah. stuff like that. I'm pretty sure that was released because I feel like so many people go on it just because you see people in a sense you get kind of like happy. That you yeah, see people. but then also like it creates that feeling of like missing out and mm-hmm. stuff like that because even though everyone's still in it together and at home together like, at home like some people don't <laughs> some people don't have like the same opportunities that being at home grants other people. Yeah, I feel like. like Sorry to interrupt. No, it's okay. I was going to say, like, different home situations, right? Like, yeah. that too. Like, some people have, like, they're, you have really good relationships with your families, right? That it's, like, it's kind of nice being at home and, like, mm-hmm. seeing all your siblings and just being all under one roof kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And there's some people who just don't have that, like, opportunity and they don't really have anywhere else to go Yeah. in a place when it's like that, in a situation like such as the pandemic. Speaking of which, like, one thing that has really risen because people don't really have anywhere to go or anything to resort to mm-hmm. is drug addiction. So, um, sorry, let me just pull up a study, um, that I found. So, basically, near the beginning of the pandemic, the, um, I just want to get get the name right. So, the European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Addiction in, so, in Europe, Mm -hmm. and the National Institute uh, on uh, Drug Abuse in the United States, both started, um, conducting, like, a lot of research really early at the beginning of the pandemic because mm-hmm. there was a lot of concerns about like uh like vulnerable people oh, resorting yeah. to substance abuse or like oh. or returning to substance abuse disorders during oh, uh, uh COVID-19 because like obviously those feelings of like depression and self-isolation like encourage you towards yeah. it when you have nowhere else to go and um yeah it, it sort of found that two things so have you heard of the term like comorbidity I've seen that word, but I'm not. Familiar. So it's basically where like, um, like health isn't or not health, but like specific diseases aren't just like individual. Like they're not one. Like no person or not no person, but oftentimes when people get sick, whether it be like a physical illness or like mm-hmm. a mental illness, yeah. Whenever that happens, it's not like occurring in isolation. It's not like, oh, I just have depression and nothing oh, else. Okay. It's like depression Some, and anxiety okay, and yeah. adding on to all that stuff. Yeah. All that stuff. So there's like other diagnosis basically. Yeah. With it. Pretty okay. much, yeah. Sorry if that was kind of a convoluted no, no, definition. No, no. <laughs> but basically what they found was that like um people who um had pre existing uh I'm losing my train of thought. Like conditions? conditions related to mental health uh, were more prone to resorting to uh, addiction and drug abuse. Yeah. And, like, even though, like, that sounds like just a study. Like, if you turn on the news almost every day, like, you'll hear about um, instances of drug addiction and okay. overdosing. I know um, in Ontario specifically when, uh, within, I think, the first two months of the uh, pandemic, like, starting and people being um, yeah. told to quarantine and stay at home, like, drug um, overdoses increased exponentially. Really? And because people, so, especially with Canada and the United States, because the borders have been closed to an extent, um, it's harder for higher quality uh, drugs to sort of oh, go across yeah. the border. 
So um, now what's being circulated on the streets is really low quality, yeah. like synthetic opioids that um, are just like far more harmful than what other like stuff that used to be around. Isn't it like, what is it called? Fent- Fent- fentanyl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was like something fit something. Yeah. So there's that. fentanyl, methamphetamines, um, various opioids, mm-hmm. heroin, um, like the quality of them, not saying that their quality was good before, like at the end of the day, it's not <laughs> good for the body, yeah. but like the stuff that they've, uh, the chemicals that they've yeah. integrated and like embedded in these drugs have gotten so much worse. It's more toxic. It's more it? toxic. It's leading to far more overdoses. That's not good. Yeah. And it's just a devastating circumstance. Like when I, f- sorry. Were no, you no, no. I was going to say, we don't need any more deaths than what we have with like the COVID-19 yeah. just being present. Yeah, it's it's devastating. Like I like that was one of the most striking things that I like learned about early on in yeah. the pan- pandemic, because um, everyone's affected by drug addiction to some extent. You might not know it, but you probably have a peer that has abused it in some sort of mm. like way. Yeah. So when I like heard about that, like that, like that hit home, and I was like, wow, that's kind of it's crazy. Like just, I mean, it makes sense. When you think of it like you have nothing else to do right like yeah. at least when like the pandemic was not occurring you had you could keep yourself busy and i feel like with addiction it that's like one of the major um like advice that people would give or just yeah. like keep yourself busy mm-hmm. like don't if you're when, when you're alone and with your own thoughts that's when it addiction kind of kicks in at yeah. its most. like to add on to that like one of the main reasons it's gotten really really bad is because um so in toronto we have these um places where if people need to use drugs Mm -hmm. if people like need to do whatever like there's places where you can go to uh, like in like self-injection sites they're called where there is uh nurses and different healthcare professionals that are present in those facilities and they'll be there to make sure that like you don't od on like whatever you're wow on whatever you're taking or have some sort of bad reaction to the drug those I'm not sure about how it is now or like the mm-hmm. like the situation with it, but throughout the pandemic, many of them have closed down because uh, like COVID, you're yeah. not allowed to have that level of contact. So wow. yeah, instead of being in these uh, areas where you can make sure that like the needles are you're using are clean and sterile, like you're doing it either on the streets yeah. or at your home, and oftentimes it's not as it's not as safe. It's yeah, not, it's not. I mean, the drugs themselves are not safe, but, like, the fact of, like, you know, there's COVID and then the drug addiction and just not doing it in the best way possible. And it leads to, like, so many, like, it. it's so devastating it because it leads to so many other conditions, like, people who, um, like, use and abuse drugs are more prone to, like, they're considered, um, what's the term? Not immunocomp, like, they're basically, like, more vulnerable to the effects of Mm COVID-19 so like respiratory conditions pulmonary conditions stuff like that yeah but yeah I just that's sad I just it's kind of it sucks because we're all in a situation that we can't like yes we to an extent we are doing what we can Mm -hmm. like the best to like stop the pandemic and whatever but like no one saw this coming right yeah I mean like to to an extent. The conspiracy theorists. <laughs> to an extent, right? There's, there's a video of um, Bill Gates, like, so... I was going to say Bill Nye. <laughs> Bill Nye predicted COVID-19. <laughs> no. But, like, epidemiologists and, like, a lot of researchers, so epidemiologists, for those of you that don't know, are people that study, like, incidences of disease and, like, the origins and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Like, the pending, like, the... The idea that an, a pandemic or, like, a global disease would be coming soon wasn't, like, completely unknown. Like, MERS, so the Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Syndrome, yeah, and then SARS um, as well. Like, those two, when they first, like, exploded back in, like, the early 2000s, mm-hmm. like, that really sounded the alarm for a lot of global health organizations to start, like, doing something about, uh, like developing proper policies and PPEs and all that kind of stuff to, like, mitigate the effects of, like, mm. looming yeah. pandemics that will inevitably occur yeah. um, in coming years. This is not the last pandemic, I hope. No, it's not <laughs> There's the first, more. and it's definitely not the last. Yeah. But it is predictable, to yeah, an extent. to an extent. 
it's ridiculous because back in the Spanish flu back in 1918, like the idea, like the idea of wearing stuff like masks and social distancing and self isolation, like all those ideas aren't new. Like they've been around for literally hundreds, like centuries. Yeah. to like prevent other pandemics yeah. but it's so unfortunate when people just don't listen and it just exacerbates like the other like the vulnerable people in our population yeah. like old people like old people oh my god like those who um yeah. endure drug addiction young people middle-aged people like all people uh, all people like honestly it sucks i know like especially like working in a long-term care like it's sad, man. Like, some of them talk to me and are like, is my son coming today? Mm-hmm. Or, like, is my daughter coming today? And they can't, right? Like, you can't have any visitors. And it's so sad because some of them look at me and because I, like, work on the dementia floor. And yeah. like, are you my granddaughter? Mm-hmm. Or, like, something. And it just, like, breaks my heart. And they're just, like, Ugh. it's actually, it's so sad. Because they're also, like, not only are they more susceptible to COVID, but they're also, like, very susceptible to, like, the isolation that's occurring. Yeah. Like, I think there's a study, right? Um, there's a study they did on, like, nursing homes and stuff where basically the impact of social isolation and quarantine actually differs per situation and, like, person. So, let's say um, an elder had, like, an elderly person had um, a condition where they had to go outside, right? Yeah. And they needed to, like, exercise and do all that stuff. Definitely with the outbreak, it caused some, like, not only, like, physical issues, but also, like, mental issues issues where they're not able to like do what they're used to do so to sorry did i cut you off no 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 no. i was so, just breathing <laughs> <laughs> but um so the more we talk about it the more like we get trapped in this really depressing narrative of everything that's been going on yeah. so to like sort of ease away from all that sadness yeah. Like, what's one thing that we can take away from this in terms of like how we can help people Mental health wise? Mental health wise, stuff like that. You know, check up on your friends virtually, guys. You mm-hmm. know, like to be honest, like I I'm gonna be honest, I don't check up on my friends. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> bad. But like to be honest, no one checks up on me. Bye. Either, but, but like you know, like hit them like no, I kinda of lied. Like I have like a friend or two kinda of messages me and just like, Hey, how are you doing? Just kinda of like you want me to do that more often? Yes, Lania. Okay. So please send me more memes. Okay. It's okay. I have my dogs, so I'm okay. Like, I have, like, a sort, like, some sort of contact. It's not human contact, but, like, you know, mm-hmm. I don't mind. Um, but, yeah, check up on your friends. Like, honestly, like, a, hey, how are you today? Or, like, what you do? It's also, it'll take, you know, make a person, oh, make a person's day or a week or a month. It's, yeah. Like, yeah. that's all I can really say. Do you have anything to say from, like, hopes from a scientific perspective Mm. in terms of, like, treatments and stuff like that to help those that are feeling lonely? Well, there are. We will be adding links (laughs) down below. (laughs) Um, But, yeah. Treatment-wise, like, I think everyone has a different way of coping, right? Mm Mm-hmm. There's two, th- I don't know if you found anything in, like, your research, but I found sort of, like, two prominent um what's it called like studies that have been going on to like sort of address feelings of loneliness so one is the efficacy of uh tele or tele telehealth sorry i'm stuttering Mm. so like telehealth is basically like virtual care so rather than going in person it's just converting like care that's normally in person to online and yeah. virtual resources yeah so this could be done for tele rehabilitation so for people that say that like Post stroke, for example, mm. my research. We'll do a video on that one day. Oh, <laughs> I love talking about it. Sorry, I kind of like deviated the conversation. Go check out our next video. <laughs> next video. But um, so there's that. But even from like a uh, like a therapy standpoint, like switching to virtual forms of care, that's yeah. kind of difficult for those who don't have Wi Fi oh, and yeah. stuff like yeah. that. But that's something that hopefully will be addressed. Another thing that I found really cool mm-hmm. sorry so they did this um sorry i'm just looking at the study yeah so there was a study done to uh talk about or basically look at the effects of like isolation on the brain 
And um, they, uh, scientists studied this group of mice, basically, they made them depressed and lonely. It sounds kind of like morbid, but yeah. they basically like isolated them and put them in cages just to see like for a few weeks to see like how their brains would respond to this loneliness. And they found that um, there's this neuro, um, there's a signaling neuropeptide called TAC2. And basically, it, um, as it says very specifically here, it basically plays a role in, like, divert, like, a wide range of cognitive functions, um, mainly in which mediating, like, the behavioral effects of self-isolation. So, there is a lot of hope and potential into researching this specific signaling neuropeptide Mm -hmm. in order to, uh, like, address that i explained that really weird so basically in the mice that they found that there was a lot of these neuropeptides and after they've been isolated for a long time so what researchers are now doing is a way to like inhibit those neuropeptides from like building up in the brain and creating medications and various uh, pharmaceutical drugs that like inhibits the production of it or the signaling and all that kind of stuff tattoo right yeah to to that yeah it's i think that's like a positive way to end off there's science is always changing yeah we're always learning new things Mm -hmm. um just because one thing is a certain way doesn't mean it can't change the next day Mm -hmm. i'm really happy i'm really (laughs) glad we had this discussion though because i learned a little bit that was cool me too and i hopefully for whoever the heck watches this our two viewers and our two viewers yeah thanks mom (laughs) (laughs) but yeah thanks for watching here until the end thank you yeah you stop it